Hello, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Shaman. I'm a professor of environmental health sciences at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. Uh, it's a pleasure being here speaking at this 32nd annual virtual conference for the uh, International Society for Environmental Epidemiology. I'm going to be talking today about some of the meteorological drivers that determine influenza viability, seasonality, and its transmissibility, uh, and also looking at how these same factors may play a role in the transmission and viability of SARS-CoV-2, the causative agent of COVID-19. I'm going to begin by showing you the overall seasonality of influenza in temperate parts of the world, and specifically here for the Northern Hemisphere. What you're looking at here is a climatology, if you will, the average daily excess pneumonia influenza mortality averaged over a 31 year period shown for two states in the United States, California and New York. And what you can see is that as you move from left to right, going from winter in January through summer and then back to winter, influenza's activity, the abundance of excess mortality, goes from a high down to a low in the summertime and then back up, rising again to the high again in January. This is a feature that's been noted for a very long time. The Greeks noticed this long before we had an understanding of what influenza was and understanding of germ theory before it was actually identified that there was this causative agent that was a virus. We understood that there were these types of diseases that caused respiratory symptoms that had a peak during the winter months in temperate parts of the world. When we look at this even to this day, we're really not certain why this seasonality exists. There are a number of competing hypotheses and they fall into three groups roughly. The first has to do with changes in our mixing patterns. And here the idea is that in the wintertime, people spend more time indoors because it's colder. That time indoors facilitates person-to-person -person proximity, greater mixing, which facilitates the transmission of the disease and results in an increase in incidence and a greater transmissibility during the winter months. The second hypothesis or group of hypotheses has to do with changes in immune function. And this has, again, a linkage to the environment, specifically to sunlight exposure. In the wintertime, in temperate and northern parts and polar regions in the southern hemisphere, we have less daylight. The day length is shorter. The sun is at a lower angle in the sky. And consequently, with that lower exposure to sunshine, there's less melatonin and vitamin D production, which may, may impair immune response. That impaired immune response may make individuals more susceptible to infection with influenza. And furthermore, it may make it harder for them to actually clear the infection once they are infected. They may run higher viral titers and they may shed more of the virus back out into the environment, thus making them more contagious. Putting these effects together, one or both of them, results in a greater incidence of flu during the winter time because of this immunomodulation. The last group of hypotheses has to do entirely with environmental conditions. And here the idea is that exposure to sunshine or temperature or humidity conditions changes the viability of the virus once it is expelled from a host. A person who's infectious with influenza is shedding the virus in their oral and nasal mucosa. They're spewing it out in droplets when they sneeze, when they cough, when they speak, even when they just breathe. And those viral droplets, once they're out in the ambient environment, are subject to the conditions that are there. They have to survive long enough intact to infect another host. So in this exposed period between hosts, the virus is subject to those conditions. And as a consequence, if they are of a certain sort, it may be less, uh, less conducive for the survival of the virus, as it were. While influenza is the best studied of the respiratory viruses that we are aware of that certainly circulate in human beings, there are many things that we still don't know about it. I spoke before about how an infectious host expels droplets out into the ambient environment. However, we actually don't know for something like flu, let alone for other respiratory viruses, and this includes COVID-19, how the virus is actually transmitted. We know how it can be, but we don't know the actual dominant modes that are responsible for the bulk of transmission from person to person. What I have listed here are four modes that are understood to be possible ways in which influenza moves from person to person. The first is direct contact. If I'm infected and I'm shedding my oral nasal mucosa and I kiss my wife, I'm going to give her the virus potentially, and that is direct contact transmission. A second route is this indirect contact, this has to do with the fact that when I speak or breathe or cough or sneeze, I'm spewing out droplets that have the virus in it. 
Some of those droplets can be very large and they will settle out on objects, things like tabletops, computer tops, they'll get on my hands, I'll put them on doorknobs, and then other people can come along and touch those and then when they're eating food or not washing their hands, rubbing their eyes, whatnot, they can transfer the virus to themselves. This is the reason why they ask people to wash their hands and it is to cut down this route of indirect transmission where the droplet settles onto something and then you touch it with your hands and transfer it to your face. The third mode is droplets. This has to do with the idea that when somebody coughs or speaks or sings or sneezes, they're going to spew out a cloud of droplets, some of which are going to get propelled away from their body. If they're talking to somebody or within proximity to them, they actually may be able to transfer the virus directly that way by the droplets hitting that person in their face. The last mode is airborne. And this has to do with the fact that some of the droplets that you expel when you are speaking or breathing or sneezing or coughing are going to be small enough that they're going to remain aerosolized. They might even evaporate down and become aerosolized, and they'll remain aloft on the turbulence in the air. As a consequence, they can persist in this airborne state. People can inhale them deep in their lungs, and they can set up an infection that way. We don't really know what the dominant mode is of, for influenza transmission, as I mentioned before. There's been a lot of debate about it. I would say early on in the mid-20th century and early 20th century, they thought airborne was the dominant route. Uh, in the 70s, it might have swung a bit towards people thinking that indirect contact was very important. I think over the last 20, 25 years, it swung back towards people thinking that airborne may be the more dominant mode of transmission for influenza, but we still don't know. To begin examination of some of the environmental drivers of influenza's viability and transmission, it's good to start with the discovery of flu itself. It was first isolated in humans in 1933. The virus itself is, has a phospholipid envelope that includes viral glycoproteins. The genome is segmented RNA. And at this point, we know of four types of flu, A, B, C, and D. Within a decade of the isolation of influenza, there were already studies being published looking at the survival and transmission of the virus and how meteorological conditions, specifically temperature and relative humidity, affected the survival of the virus. One of the earliest studies was published by Loosely et al. in 1943, where they did studies in a room at set temperature range. They used influenza A, which they took from an infected mouse lung, and they atomized it, so they aerosolized it, into the room in fine droplets. They then would put mice in the room at various times for 20 minutes, and they would look at the dead mice to examine for lung lesions. The remaining mice that weren't infected or didn't seem to be infected were sacrificed and examined 14 days after the experiment. What they found is that at 80 to 90 percent relative humidity, the virus was lethal for 30 minutes, but not infective after one hour. At 45 to 55 percent relative humidity, when they placed the mice in the room within the first 80 minutes, it was lethal, but it was not infected after six hours. And then at the lowest humidity level, 17 to 24 percent relative humidity, it was lethal for six hours for the mice when introduced. It was 40 percent lethal at 12 hours and it was not infective at 24 hours. That first study by Loosely et al. in 1943 seems to indicate that at low relative humidity conditions, the virus influenza remains viable longest and is lethal longest for mice placed in a room with it, whereas at high relative humidity conditions, after a short duration, the virus is no longer capable of infecting and killing the mice. However, this early study is not always supported by subsequent findings. For instance, this 1950 study by Schechmeister, in which the temperature and room conditions are not entirely clear, used influenza A as well. In this case, it was egg culture. They also atomized it into fine droplets. Rather than looking at transmission and lethality in mice, they actually just recovered the virus directly from the air and looked at the viability of it within the aerosols. What they found was minimal recovery of viable virus not at the highest relative humidity conditions, but rather at intermediate relative humidity conditions here in the 58 to 60 percentile. A subsequent study by Harper in 1961 ran experiments at various temperatures, again using influenza A, and again aerosolizing them, this time into a rotating drum apparatus. They sampled the air at select time intervals after they aerosolized it and looked at the survival of the virus over time. What they found in this study was increased survival at low relative humidity and low temperatures. 
A number of additional studies looking at the survival and viability of influenza virus were conducted during the 1940s through the 1970s. Overall, these studies show two different sets of findings. There's a group that shows that influenza survival and infectivity is maximal at low relative humidity, but there's also another that's more like the Schechtmeister study that shows that it's actually maximal both at low and high relative humidity. The discrepancies between these findings could be results of methodological approaches, the virus strain used, the culture medium used. It's difficult to disentangle. I'm going to fast forward to a more recent study that was conducted by a group of virologists at Mount Sinai in New York City. They had determined that the guinea pig, the actual animal, the guinea pig, was a very effective model for studying human influenza. And they conducted a chamber experiment in the laboratory in which they took eight guinea pigs and they infected four of them with influenza and the other four would be exposed. They would put them in chamber, such as what you're seeing there, with four levels and each guinea pig is in its own cage and on each level they would have one infected and one exposed guinea pig. There was a slight airflow going from the infected towards the exposed and they were left inside this chamber for 72 hours. A number of outcomes were explored. Among them, how many of the guinea pigs that were exposed, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, came down with influenza after 72 hours. Now they repeated this experiment with this chamber 20 times using different temperature and relative humidity conditions. And what they found were some marginally statistically significant effects in which colder temperatures and lower relative humidity conditions favored the transmission of influenza two guinea pigs in this chamber. My own background is in atmospheric science and climate. And when I read this paper, I was a little puzzled why they were varying both temperature and relative humidity inside their chambers. Relative humidity can be a very meaningful variable biologically. It's the thing that we hear about the most when we're given humidity on the weather report. However, it's not well constrained if temperature is being adjusted, and it doesn't give a measure of the actual amount of water vapor in the air. And to illustrate this, this plot on the right shows you 100% relative humidity and 50% relative humidity. These are the lines. And what you can see is that as the temperature rises, as it moves from left to right, and there's a temperature in degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure, which is a pressure-based measure of the amount of water vapor in the air, increases exponentially. And it's a very powerful effect that goes on that's well known within atmospheric science. And it's very meaningful. Air with 50% relative humidity at 25 degrees Celsius has nearly four times as much water vapor as air with 50% relative humidity at five degrees Celsius. So my question when I read this is, why not actually look at a measure of absolute humidity rather than relative humidity? So we set about to answer this question. We use these equations that you see here, the Clausius-Clapeyron equation and the equation for relative humidity to back out a measure of the vapor pressure, the pressure-based estimate of the amount of water vapor in the air inside those chambers. And we redid the analysis, analyzing what fraction of guinea pigs had become infected at different relative humidities, temperatures, and vapor pressures. And what you can see in the top two plots is a reproduction of the marginally statistically significant effects that they saw in their own analysis, and that at lower relative humidity conditions and lower temperatures, you were seeing more of the guinea pigs becoming infected after 72 hours in the chamber. However, when we calculated out the vapor pressure and redid the regression analysis here, we found a much stronger, more statistically significant relationship with vapor pressure, this measure of absolute humidity. The authors of the guinea pig study had put forth a number of hypotheses to explain why humidity conditions might modulate the transmission of influenza virus amongst guinea pigs in those chambers. The first of these was that virus-laden aerosols, which are called droplet nuclei, would be more efficiently produced at lower humidities, and at those lower humidities, there would be increased evaporation. The consequence of this is that droplets coming out of the infected guinea pigs would more likely be evaporated down to a size where they could be aerosolized flow throughout the chamber and move from one cage to another to infect the exposed guinea pig. We set up a very simple model that actually um, simulated rates of sedimentation as well as evaporation under varying conditions to actually test this hypothesis. The results of these simulation experiments, however, produced findings that were inconsistent with the results from the guinea pig chamber experiment, however. For the model, what we found was that warmer conditions and drier humidity conditions would favor 
the aerosolization of droplet nuclei. This is in contrast to what was seen inside the chambers where it was actually colder temperatures and lower relative humidity conditions that were favoring the transmission between the guinea pigs. Furthermore, we came to realize that evaporation really proceeds as a function of something called vapor pressure deficit, which is represented by equation one there. And then if we were to back that out and actually do an analysis of the percent of transmission or the fraction of guinea pigs that were infected as a function of this vapor pressure deficit, there was no significant relationship. So this seemed to indicate that it is not evaporation dynamics that are actually impacting whether or not transmission is going to take place. There was an alternate second hypothesis, however, as well. And that was that influenza virus survival increases as humidity decreases such that the airborne virus is viable longer at lower humidity conditions. Now, we set about trying to test this by looking through some of those older experiments that I showed you before and trying to find one that tested the viability of the virus, the survival of influenza, in the external environment as a function of both temperature and relative humidity conditions and which actually had their data in the paper. And the one experiment that satisfied this was the 1961 study of Harper that I presented before. And in this, they had shown one hour, six hour, and 23 hour survival of the virus following its atomization. And we repeated the analysis that we shown before for the guinea pigs here. We looked at it versus relative humidity versus temperature. And we also looked at it versus vapor pressure, this measure of absolute humidity. And what we found were the same kinds of results. We found marginally statistically significant relationships with relative humidity and with temperature, such that at drier relative humidities or at colder temperatures, the virus remained viable longer. However, when we looked at vapor pressure, this measure of absolute humidity, we got a very strong relationship. In fact, simple log linear regression, 90% of one hour influenza virus survival in these experiments of Harper is explained by absolute humidity conditions. The findings of both the 1961 Harper experiments looking at influenza viability when aerosolized, as well as the 2007 Lowet et al. findings using the guinea pigs in chambers, indicate that low humidity levels favor influenza virus survival and influenza transmission. This occurs for both relative humidity and for absolute humidity. However, for absolute humidity, it's a much more statistically significant relationship. Absolute humidity, furthermore, is minimal both indoors and outdoors during the wintertime, which means that it is phased correctly by the seasonal cycle of humidity in temperate and polar regions, such that it is low in the wintertime, which would favor the survival and the transmission of the virus. And this is the time of year when we indeed do see lots of influenza activity. I'd like to tell you that's it. Case closed. Low Absolute humidity conditions favor the survival and the, and the transmission of influenza, and that's why we see it uh, peaking in temperate parts of the world during the wintertime. However, studies since then have also led to some conflicting results. For instance, Udin, using some mathematical models, argued that for envelope viruses, such as influenza, there's actually a competition between the rate of water diffusing into the envelope versus the rate of water evaporating from the droplet, which leads to minimal viability at intermediate relative humidities. Yang et al. measured influenza A viability in droplets of various model media and of various relative humidities and found that viability was highest when relative humidity was near saturation or below 50%, regardless of the medium, medium, indicating that intermediate relative humidities is when the virus was minimally viable. On the other hand, McDevitt tested influenza A droplet survival in varying humidity conditions at higher temperatures and found that absolute humidity was a better predictor of survival on surfaces and could inform disinfection practices. And then there's the more recent study of Cormeth et al., which found that influenza A was insensitive to relative humidity when both in droplet and aerosolized, if in a solution that included extracellular material from human bronchial epithelial cells. Without that extracellular material, there was a sensitivity to relative humidity, but presumably when people are excreting droplets from their lungs, there would be some extracellular material from their bronchial epithelial. So this was a very confusing finding as well to find a situation where there was actually no sensitivity to humidity conditions, in this case, relative humidity. So what we're left with is a bit of laboratory discord. The results from virus survival and animal model experiments are not wholly consistent. It's not clear if humidity is a modulator of influenza survival and transmissibility or just a clever proxy for some other modulator.
It's not clear whether the viability of the influenza virus is lowest at intermediate or high relative humidity conditions. And it's not really clear whether relative humidity or absolute humidity conditions are more relevant. Further, it's not known what the underlying physical chemical mechanism is that would underpin an association between ambient humidity conditions and the survival and transmissibility of influenza virus. Put another way, when you expel an influenza virus out into the ambient air and it's contained in a droplet full of mucins, surfactants, salts, and glycoproteins, why does it care about what ambient humidity conditions are? Do those conditions result in pH changes or salt toxicity changes or osmotic pressure gradients or absorption that affect the viability of the virus? This remains unknown. That said, epidemiological evidence does seem to point to an effect of humidity on the seasonality and transmissibility of influenza. If we look at conditions in the United States, you can drive a simple humidity forced model of influenza using observed humidity conditions and reproduce the seasonal cycle of influenza. Furthermore, we observe that the onset of seasonal influenza outbreaks in the United States measured at state level using that excess pneumonia and influenza mortality is associated with anomalous excursions of lower than normal absolute humidity conditions. And regression analyses also find similar results. This has been found for the US using influenza and pneumonia excess mortality. It's been found in the Netherlands using other estimates and proxies of influenza, as well as in Israel. Further, it's important to recognize that outdoor absolute humidity predicts indoor absolute humidity. This is not the case for temperature or for relative humidity. In fact, absolute humidity is strongly correlated indoors and outdoors on diurnal, synoptic, and seasonal timescales. This is because we manage indoor temperatures. That's what's shown in the top plot. You can see a, a time series record in the winter in New York City apartments of outdoor temperature in blue. And then in orange, it's showing you the indoor temperatures. The lower plot shows the same thing, but it's showing it for vapor pressure, a measure of absolute humidity. And you can see how the variability is very closely related indoors and outdoors. And in fact, Indoor environments are often very dry in winter because we do not manage humidity conditions indoors. So there's a very large seasonal cycle of humidity conditions indoors, absolute humidity conditions specifically, that would be consistent with it favoring the survival and transmission of flu during wintertime in temperate and polar regions of the world. The various findings about humidity, influenza survival, and transmissibility is also broached the question of whether you could use humidity as a non-pharmaceutical intervention to control influenza outbreaks. There has been a study that was done uh, by people at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota in the United States to actually look at this. They used humidity as an intervention in a community preschool in which they raised the vapor pressure, this measure of absolute humidity, from 6.33 to 9.89 millibars on average. That's about, took it up to about 45% relative humidity. And in those classrooms, they took air samples and swabbed objects. They found a number of interesting effects. They found a significant decrease of influenza A on fomites and in particles in the humidified classes versus the non-humidified classes. They found a significant decrease of infectivity of collected samples in humidified classrooms. They found a lower copy number of influenza A positive samples in the humidified classrooms. And they also found fewer influenza-like absences in humidified classrooms. Obviously, more research needs to be done in this, but it is suggestive, and these are very interesting preliminary findings, suggesting that humidity might be possibly used as a non-pharmaceutical intervention against influenza. So I'm going to step away from influenza to talk a little bit now about coronaviruses. There are four endemic coronaviruses that circulate in human populations. These cause mild colds. Uh, they haven't been that well studied because they are mild. They're not considered that clinically significant as a consequence. But what you're seeing here are some time series of positivity rates for nasal pharyngeal swabs taken from people presenting with influenza-like illness in New York City over a four-plus year time period. And what you can see is that these viruses, Corona NL63, HKU1, OC43, and 229E, seem to possess a seasonal cycle that maximizes in winter. The black line shows you influenza's positivity rates for the same time, but what you can see is that coronaviruses are matching it fairly well. So this has led to the speculation that perhaps the coronaviruses 
are similarly sensitive to environmental conditions as may be the case for flu. It may be humidity, but maybe something else, temperature, UV radiation, we don't quite know as of yet, but it's very intriguing that these endemic coronaviruses have this same seasonal signal. Now, with the emergence of the novel coronavirus that's causing the pandemic currently, SARS-CoV-2, there's obviously the concern about how to control it. And one of the interesting things that we really want to understand epidemiologically is whether that coronavirus has a similar seasonal cycle to the endemic coronaviruses. Is it going to be more transmissible during winter times in temperate regions of the world? To date, there have been a few studies looking at the survival of SARS-CoV-2 and when exposed to different temperature, humidity, and sunlight conditions. Strangely, one of the first ones was shown on a placard on a poster at a press conference in May by President Trump of the United States. And these were supposedly done in a laboratory by the DOD, I believe. I haven't seen any publication on this further, but what it showed was that this virus, if these results are true, is very sensitive to sunlight and quickly degrades when exposed to it. That's not uncommon for a lot of respiratory viruses once they're expelled from a host. And it also that it had some sensitivities to temperature and relative humidity that are actually consistent with what we see for flu and might be consistent with absolute humidity being the dominant modulator of the viability of this virus. Some peer-reviewed studies have begun to emerge of late. This one shows what, how the virus decays at 20 degrees Celsius in aerosols when exposed to sunlight in two different medium. One is a medium that's a culture, the other is saliva. And in both that we can see that the higher the intensity of the simulated sunlight, the faster the virus breaks down. Another study by the same group showed that UV radiation also breaks down the virus, SARS-CoV-2, when it is on surfaces. And the same group, when looking at aerosolized SARS-CoV-2 at 20 degrees Celsius, found little evidence of modulation of its viability or decay as a result of relative humidity conditions. In addition, a number of epidemiological studies have been conducted looking at the effects of weather, pollution, and UV radiation on COVID-19 transmission dynamics. These are beginning to percolate through the peer review process. This just shows you one that's actually still in peer review, I imagine, because it's on Med Archive. And it, what it indicates is that case growth rates, in other words, the growth of, of COVID-19 cases locally, is modulated to some degree by temperature, UV radiation conditions, and pollution. So overall, as is often the case in science, we're left with both some clarity and some confusion. Among the laboratory studies, there's no consensus really on the effects of humidity on influenza survival. However, epidemiological data suggests a clearer effect, particularly in temperate regions and polar regions of the world, in which drier humidity conditions favor the transmissibility of the virus. We need to identify the mechanisms responsible, however. We need to understand why an influenza virus contained in a droplet expelled from a human health is actually affected by ambient atmospheric conditions in the first place. First reported humidity intervention studies, that one I showed you from the Mayo Clinic, shows that there may be some significant effects and that non-pharmaceutical interventions using humidity modulation may be a way of controlling seasonal influenza. Presently, we don't particularly manage humidity well indoors, however. When we look at what this means for endemic coronaviruses, we note that they exhibit the same seasonality as influenza. But whether SARS-CoV-2 is affected by ambient atmosphere conditions is not fully resolved. There is some preliminary evidence suggesting that there may be some modulation, but it is not enough to substantially reduce the viability of SARS-CoV-2 such that there isn't transmission in the summertime or in warmer conditions during this current early phase of the pandemic when susceptibility to the pathogen is very high. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and your time. It's been a pleasure to speak to you this way during this virtual conference of the ICEE. I'd like to acknowledge some of the collaborators who contributed to the portions of the work that I presented here that came out of my own lab and my own work. Thank you.